Hi everyone. In my previous video from uh, the review of Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, uh, we were getting the response from Piper and Grudem to why it is an important subject in the first place. And they showed a lot of foresight as to what the effect would be if we have uh, not given this the attention it deserves. And uh, I missed a portion of what I had wanted to read the last time, so I'm going to start with that little portion about what they think the bottom line is as to why it's important for us to have this discussion and read these things. They say, to, to us it is increasingly and painfully clear that biblical feminism is an unwitting partner in unraveling the fabric of complementary manhood and womanhood that provides the foundation not only for biblical marriage and biblical church order, but also for heterosexuality itself. So the, the fabric of life is being affected by our changing perspectives and views about the roles of manhood and womanhood. So in, uh, in today's society, I think we've all noticed that there's an effort being made to close the distinctions between male and female. And to many, this is a good step. They believe it's uh, a good idea, and they even use scripture to try and make their point. One of the scriptures that they use is Galatians 3, verse 28. And so I wanted to read you the response of Piper and Grudem to, to this question. So I'm going to read you the question that was posed to them. Does Paul's statement that there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28, take away gender as a basis for distinction of roles in the church. Now here is their, their answer. No. Most evangelicals still agree that this text is not a warrant for homosexuality. In other words, most of us do not force Paul's neither male nor female beyond what we know from other passages he would approve. For example, we know that Romans 1 verses 24 to 32, that Paul does not mean for the created order of different male and female roles to be overthrown by Galatians 3.28. The context of Galatians 3.28 makes abundantly clear the sense in which men and women are equal in Christ. They are equally justified by faith, verse 24, equally free from the bondage of legalism, verse 25, equally children of God, verse 26, equally clothed with Christ, verse 27, equally possessed by Christ, verse 29 and equally heirs of the promises to Abraham. Verse 29. This last blessing is especially significant, namely the equality of being a fellow heir with men of the promises. In 1 Peter 3, verses 1 to 7, the blessing of being joint heirs of the gracious gift of life is connected with the exhortation for women to submit to their husbands, verse 1, and for their husbands to treat their wives with respect as the weaker partner. In other words, Peter saw no conflict between neither male nor female principle regarding our inheritance and the headship submission principle regarding our roles. 
Galatians 3.28 does not abolish gender-based roles established by God and redeemed by Christ. Uh, so th he did refer to a passage of scripture that I thought we should probably read because this is part of their argument is Paul. Paul is the author of, of Romans, the letter to the Romans, and he is giving a description of, of sinful humanity in Romans chapter 1. Uh, we're going to read the verses that they mention, verses 24 to 32. which read, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God and those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now I know this is, this is a, a difficult passage. They're very strong words in this passage of scripture. But we have to ask ourselves, is God the judge? As our creator, does he provide our standards, the standards we should be living by? Are we choosing standards that we agree with and then dis discarding those that we don't agree with on the basis of our own personal feelings or emotion or, um, or opinion? Uh, so to me, uh, this is, is a description not of a single type of person. It's all of us. It's a description of the human race. All of us have sinful inclinations, and we can either give in to them or reject them, resist them. This uh, passage is clear. It is not about our feelings, and it is not hate. It is allowing God to be God. I'm going to link to a video that we did when we were going through the book of Genesis. The link is Cain's Six Generations, Microcosm of Human Condition. Civilization begets sexual license and violence. And it was based on readings when we were going through Genesis chapter 4. 